but I, I had a wonderful opportunity this last week. Uh, there was a church service that was supposed to be held at the facility. Uh, there's a very wonderful Lutheran church in the area that holds services there on Wednesdays. It was Wednesday or Thursday. And something happened and the pastor there uh, was unable to make it. And so I jumped up and volunteered. For a <laughs> and I had a captive audience of a whole bunch of people that never expected to hear that message. They didn't move at all. Actually, I was free to choose any portion of scripture I'd like. Guess what they got? John 3. And at any rate, when we finished John 3, the universal comment was, I've never heard that before. <laughs> and my response was, I don't doubt it. And we even had an altar call there. It was, it was really pretty cool. So at any rate. They never heard John chapter 3. Some of those people had been in church all their lives. And they had, they had never, they, they had heard John 3 gone over, but they had never heard the scripture explained as it relates to salvation. They had never heard a salvation message. And it was, it was quite the deal. We, certainly not because of my delivery, but because of the strength and power of the word. There were people there in tears. And that was quite a sight to see. Some of my own staff were, were in the room and they were listening and at several junctures in the scripture, they just looked at each other. And it was quite an, quite an experience. And in your prayers, I'd appreciate it. I, um, there are staff members there that are believers that uh, have not been able to find a place to fellowship. And at any rate, uh, I threw the door, the, the, the opportunity open for a midweek uh, Bible study there. And uh, haven't heard back from anybody yet, but I can, you know how you know when God's working? And at any rate, I can just see that. I know in my own life there have been times when I ran and ran and ran and ran until I finally gave up and found out I had run right into Jesus. My wife's laughing. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but at any rate, some of those folks were in the same boat. And I can see it, you know? And I just kind of stand back and grin and just watch. And uh, I believe that God may do something, uh, do something there, and, and we want to see that. We just want to be a part of it in prayer. Amen? Amen. This morning, we're in John, the fifth chapter, John 5. Remember that the purpose of John was not to produce a perfect and detailed chronology of the entire life of Jesus. John's purpose, as we've said many times, is recorded in the 20th chapter, where he says the sole purpose of the writing of his gospel was to bolster the belief of believers. It's written to believers. Of the eight miracles that Jesus did that are recorded, we're about to have a bird's eye view of, a, of number three. If you'll recall, the scripture says that of all the things that Jesus did were recorded, that the earth could not contain all the books. And that's true. So John and the selection of these vignettes 
is making an attempt to make very specific statements so that believers might believe and to deal with the heresy of Gnosticism. Like the idea that there is a knowledge that comes from some place other than the Word of God. If you want to know how to identify a cult, there are two key features. One is in some manner they will imply that they have Jesus new and improved. Jesus is not new. As a matter of fact, John 1, 1 tells us that through him all things were made. The second one is that they have information that is in addition to the canonized word of God and that it has equal weight, that it is equally scripture. We find that with the Jehovah's Witnesses, many of whom are very devout and sincere people. But sincerity is not a proof, a test for proof, or it is not a test for truth. You can believe something absolutely sincerely and still be sincerely wrong. And I've used a number of analogies for that in the past. But you can believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, based on the word of another person, that there is no bullet in the chamber, that it's next going to be up when you pull the trigger on the gun pointed at your head. But if the gun is fully loaded, you have no chance to win. So Jesus knew and improved and extra biblical knowledge. And John is dealing with that business of extra biblical knowledge. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. John's purpose here isn't to talk about which feast. Remember, there are three principal feasts as we went through Leviticus. Three principal feasts where all the men in Israel had to make the journey to Jerusalem. It was not relevant which one. John's not teaching in a chronology. He's making a point that everybody knew what it was like when they came together for a feast. Josephus tells us that at feast time, at the time of Jesus, there were somewhere between one and three million people in and around Jerusalem. It was shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow. Everybody was extremely close. You were lucky if you could find a place to stay. And after, after this was the Feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, just like all the other Jews. Now, there was in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in the Hebrew, Bethsaida having five porches. We know because of archaeological excavations that the information that's going to be shared about this pool is absolutely correct. Having excavated the wall and finding the area around the lion's gate which was just up from the sheep gate and there were pools with five tiers. And the idea is in the five tiers that because of the intensity of the heat and the sun in the area, it was just as important to get under some covering for shade in the summer as it is to get in out of the rain in the winter. The particular pool that's being talked about Bethsaida or Bethesda in the Hebrew language means the place of mercy. The place where mercy is dispensed. Mercy by definition is to render to somebody a hand that they don't deserve. It's undeserved, unmerited favor. 
So now, now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, a historically accurate place, a pool which in the Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. Now, I, you know, I wrestled with whether or not to say this, but I think it needs to be said because of the times we live in. One of the great proofs of the truth of Christianity and the, and the principal truth in my mind is the fact that the scripture records things hundreds of years before they happen. Another great proof is that archeological finds correspond to what the scripture tells us about. When it talks about a particular place, oftentimes ruins of that place can be found. Artifacts that indicate that the peoples that are spoken of in the scripture are actually the people who lived in that place at that time. And there is evidence that coincides with the story that's being recorded in the scripture, meaning that it isn't something that's just made up, but rather it's the recording of actual events. And I would challenge those who have been either instructed in or by various groups that say they represent God and apply the same test to those extra biblical writings they have, saying that they are equal with scripture and say, show me the archeological evidence that the places that are mentioned, the people that are talked about were known to the world in general. Now I say that of course, because in reality, there are some very large religiously based organizations who claim to have extra books inspired by God that record the history of America, that record the idea that those who live in America, the Native Americans, were actually a lost tribe of Israel and that they made a journey from Israel and eventually come, came to Central America, then up through Central America and into the Southern and eventually the Northern United States. There's only one problem with it. There is not a single shred of archeological evidence that any of the places they talked about ever existed, that any of the people groups they ever talked about ever existed. It, it, their writings cannot stand up to the same standard of proof that scripture stands up to. And I'll leave it to you to decide who that group is. Marlene will be happy about that. Verse three. In these, the porches, lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Now there is a peculiarity about verse four. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. What problem am I talking about? What we find in the fourth verse does not appear in all most ancient manuscripts. Some omit verse four entirely. Now the question comes, does that mean that the scripture is in error? I believe that it probably was there. However, I don't believe as we read it in English, that we take it the same way John intended it. Or you could reasonably say, why do you think that? Anytime you get a report of miraculous healing, and there are a group of people who are absolutely desperate because there is no cure 
because their life is terribly damaged by their, by their infirmity. It is natural for, for some of those people to throng to the place or the person who is reported to have been a part of those healings. I believe what's occurring here is that John is explaining why all these people are there, not giving some verification that an angel came down and stirred the water, but he was telling the story that gives the reason that all these people were assembled. Now there's some things about this that just don't match what I see any place else in the scripture. Number one, there is no example in the scripture where God dealt with people in such a way that number one, he used a parlor trick mentality to have an angel come down and stir water and then pit possibly several hundred, maybe thousands of extremely hurt people. People who have been waiting for healing, some for most of their lives, and then set up some kind of competition between these people that if they can somehow, in their halting manner, drag themselves to the pool, that the one who tried the hardest, went the fastest, got rewarded with healing. That doesn't sound like Jesus to me. I suggest, therefore, that this is a recounting of the story, the rumor that had circulated in the area. And those who did not understand the character of God told that story over and over and over and people got there trying to do in the same vein that Jews were trying to live their lives by their works. It gave them hope that there was something that they could do that would impact the condition that they were in. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the steering of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. That was the story. That's what drew all these people. Now, reality begins. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Inductively, let's take this apart. Who are the people in the story? The Son of God. God come, into the come in the flesh. The second person of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. According to the first chapter of John, the one through whom all that was created was created was there. There were potentially thousands of people on the five porches around the pool at Bethsaida. But Jesus did what God has always done. Do you remember Jesus said, and we'll say later in this scripture, I do nothing of myself. What I see my father do, that's what I do. In other words, you are seeing the mirror reflection of what God the Father thinks, says, and does in me. That's how I do it. And it says that he comes to the pool 
And now he finds a man that has the greatest need and has come to the end of his rope. He's become hopeless. He came to the place where everybody told him that if he just did things a certain way, he'd get healed. He's been sitting there. He's been ill 38 years. 38 years. And presumably, he's seen one person after another after another, after another, get their healing. And now he sits there. He's absolutely resigned to the facts of his past. And it brings him to a place of despair. And when he comes to the end of himself, has lost all confidence, that he can do anything to affect his situation, that it is incurable. He has no access to the healing power that's in that water. Jesus focuses on him. Jesus, we find throughout the scripture, when he walked into the room, and you'll remember me teaching this before, Luke, always focused on the person with the greatest need. The person who had come to the end of themselves and the person who was ready to give up on themselves as their own answer. Jesus approaches this man. Do you know what? This guy's going to find that the secret to a cure, well, I'm going to go on to this first. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. There is a problem. The man immediately begins to recount his situation as it exists in his own eyes. Jesus gives no credence to what he says. Jesus asked the man, do you want to be healed? And the man immediately goes into a diatribe of how bad his life is and why there is no hope. Friends, this is a trick of the devil. If the devil can tie you up continuously with everything you've ever done wrong, when there is a tape that plays in your heart and your mind of every shortcoming, everything you've ever done wrong, everything that's a problem. He can stop you from getting what God has for you today. When Jesus talked to the man, all he asked him was nothing about his past, nothing about what he thinks his circumstance is. The God who created the universe simply said, do you want it to be different? Here, now, today. Do you want it to be different? And in order to do that, you've got to put away all the things of the past. The psalmist tells us that when we're forgiven of our sin, that he removes it from us as far as the east is from the west. You notice he didn't say from the north to the south. You know why? Because if you're on the North Pole and you go south far enough, you'll eventually come around the other side and go north. He said he would take our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. You start in the east and you start around the world, you'll always go west. In other words, when he's forgiven it, it's done, let it go. It doesn't exist anymore. 
and if the things that comes to your heart and mind when God's word says something, when that comes to your mind, it is not from the spirit of the almighty God of this universe. It's your adversary, the devil, that's trying to remind you of a slate that's been wiped clean. Let it go. Because if you know what the scripture says for your today, your sins washed away. You're much loved to the Father. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Man, that'll make you want to shout. That's what's in the mind of God. And everything that tells you you're not good enough, that tells you you've been sitting by that pool for all these years and it ain't coming. Everything that tells you that God's not going to be faithful to his word. It's all a lie. Jesus loves us and he's faithful. Jesus ignores the man's focus on his circumstances. He used to have a friend. He said he ran into a man. He says, how you doing? He says, I'm doing fine under the circumstances. And his standard answer was, what are you doing under there? That's not where you belong. You belong believing the word of God. You belong believing no matter what you feel, that his commitment to you is yea and amen. That there is nothing more faithful in the universe than God's commitment to a believer. Nothing. And when you get a hold of that, and when that becomes your reality for today, when the Savior comes and says, are you ready for it? Today's your day. It's time. If you, got out, if you have a hold of the word, these things won't hold you back. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, this is Saturday. It's the Sabbath. Do you remember we said in addition to the law of Moses that the Pharisees, the 6,000, were absolutely committed to the writings of the rabbis, extra biblical writings? And that in those writings, there was 25 chapters to tell you how to keep the Sabbath. One of them said you could do absolutely no work. No work. You could do nothing that exerted your muscles. You couldn't cook on the Sabbath. The law was so tight, you could barely breathe on the Sabbath. Jesus walks up to the man and he says, I want you to get up and I want you to pick up your bed. And I want you to walk. And immediately the man was made well. It doesn't say immediately the man had enough faith. It doesn't say immediately the man broke into Holy Ghost shouts. Though he could have. It says immediately the man got up. I don't know what he felt like. All I know is, Jesus said, get up and take up your bed. And you know what the man did? If Jesus said it, he'll enable me to do it. That's true throughout the entire scripture. If there's a commandment in there, and Jesus says, do it or don't do it, he will give you the power to do it or don't do it. If you've made up your mind that he loves you and you surrender to that. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and the day was the Sabbath. Oh my gosh, the king of the universe has ordered to man to violate the rabbinical writings. Not the law of Moses, the rabbinical writings, the Mishnah. And the Jews therefore said to him, who has cured you? 
It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Look at the heart of the religious establishment of the day. This guy wasn't one of the people who came to Jerusalem to observe the feast. This is a guy that's been sitting by the pool of Bethsaida day after day after day, maybe for as long as 38 years. He's been sitting there. The Jews have walked past him to and from every day. He was a regular fixture. This guy was no fake. All of a sudden, there's strength in his legs, and he's standing, and he has his life. And the Pharisees, do they stand up and they say, God has blessed you, and break into a hallelujah chorus? No. Their one concern was to be sure that everybody told to mark to their definition of the law. They had no sense of compassion for this man. They had no heart for his plight. They had none of that. And they demanded of him ignoring the fact that he was healed, except that it was done on the Sabbath, and then told him, and you're in sin because you carried your mat. And he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Can I paraphrase this a little bit? It's a Sabbath day, and you're carrying your bed. Yeah, you've been healed. Why are you doing this? That man could have turned around to each one of those Pharisees and said, you walked by me for 38 years. You had 38 years of opportunity if what you had had, had any power in it to do something about my situation, and you did nothing. But the man that walked up to me and said, rise, take up your bed and walk, he healed me, and when he healed me, I did what he told me to do. When we get in touch with the gift of God to us in salvation and how much we have been forgiven and how free we are and how everything that comes